Hello and welcome once again to Four Wheels Good. Stay with us for the next half hour as we fill your home with auto facts and figures that you then can go and dine out on. On this show, John Stanley, the classic car king, takes a spin in the BMW Z1. We learn how easy it is for your car to catch fire and we dive on down inside motors. But first, you remember last week, Richard Warren, our motorsport master, was at Snetterton talking to the Fiesta drivers. Well, this time he's been catching up with touring car drivers from the Ford Works team and privateer driver Rob Gravitt. He met them earlier in the season, you might remember, and now he's eager to find out more about the notorious race within a race, the privateer cup within the British Touring Car Championship. Three minutes to start session. You may remember that earlier in the season we were following the fortunes of two touring car teams, the Ford Mondeo team and Graham Hathaway's uh, Total Privateer Cup team featuring Rob Gravitt. Well, we're up here at Snetterton following them again through the championship. We missed a few rounds recently, but we're updating ourselves and finding out what they've been doing in the last two rounds. Well, Will, obviously you had a quite a, an interesting weekend last weekend. You actually could have finished up in the top ten, but uh, obviously here we are at Snetterton now and uh, looking forward to trying to get a, a higher finish here. Yeah, I mean, Knock Hill was a, probably a weekend to forget, but it, it promised more and we didn't get the results uh, for various reasons. But um, I, I always enjoy Snetterton. It's, um, I've always had fairly good results here um, ever since I started racing. So it's sort of my home circuit uh, since I was sort of brought up near Cambourne and brought up near Cambridge so uh, I guess the first race circuit I came to to even watch motor racing so I just hadn't always had an affinity with it and uh, it's just maybe suits my style of driving I don't know but uh, yeah I'm, I'm uh, cautiously optimistic for a good weekend. Well Paul you're obviously having a, a bit of a testing season with the Mondeo, um, how do you feel so far about the season? Well you're right testing is, 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 uh, is the word, it's, you know, it's been a difficult season so far but uh, every time the car goes out you know we uh, we improve it each time, so um, yeah, there is light there at the end of the tunnel. And as I say, every time we go out, the car gets a little better and a little better. It must be very frustrating for you as a driver because obviously you're getting a lot of times back, and you think, well, could have done better there, and then you sort of get a bit more time each time you do go testing. But on the days like today, when you're out trying to get those elusive tenths, uh, what keeps you going? Well, it's you know it is frustrating, but it's uh, you know it's the same for everybody. You've uh, you can only push the car around as quick as you know as the car will go, and uh, everybody's doing the same thing. So it is frustrating, sure, if you're not right at the top of the the timesheets. But um, you just got to concentrate and work hard with with what you've got and and try your best. And uh, usually that's where the the motivation comes from. And okay, if it's not first, well then you've got to say, you've, you know you've got to realise that you're not going to be challenging perhaps for first that weekend and. Uh, you just got to do your, you, you know, your very best, and, and keep working on those little tiny tents, and you know, hopefully they'll come come to you at the end of the weekend. Well, Rob, obviously uh, two rounds since we last spoke to you. Uh, what's been what's been happening with you? Well, we had a really good race at uh, or two races at Knockhill in Scotland. That was very good for us. We won both the uh, the events and got pole position as well in both of them, so very pleased with that. We struggled a bit at Croft um, the couple of weeks before, or actually three or four weeks before. Um, it's a very high speed circuit and the car didn't like the high speed corners and strangely enough the Honda is normally very good. But um, we've done a lot of homework, we did a little bit of testing in between and um, that's carried on through to Knock Hill and of course now we're here at Snetterton and we seem to be going quite quickly here as well. Mm, yeah, because obviously they've changed the circuit since you were last here. Yeah, very much changed. Um, they've done a very good job on the circuit actually, I'd say. Um, it's made the back straight a little bit shorter. I can remember in the RS500 days, I think we were seeing about 170 down there, but uh, we're a little bit slower in these cars, but of course the cornering speeds of the two litre cars are much higher than the RS500 days. And obviously your tyres are just as important as the guys running in the big, the big time, aren't they really? 
Yeah, I mean, obviously we're trying to make an impression at the moment. I have to try and get as many points as I can in the independent series um, because uh, that's the main reason that we're here. But uh, if we can gain an advantage there, then uh, I, you know, I can obviously have my head a little bit more and uh, try and give some of the factory cars a bit of a hard time. We did that a little bit at Knock Hill as well anyway. Yeah, because you were up mixing it with Derek Warwick and John Clowndy, I understand. I found myself ahead of uh, the Vauxhalls and the Fords uh, at one stage and... Um, I didn't actually really want to be there, so uh, I actually let them pass because I didn't want to get embroiled in a situation. Uh, we were there to do a job and uh, I had to drive with the head more than the heart effectively. Because obviously it's very difficult for you, obviously, because you're not really racing against them, but obviously what, what's sort of the criteria in the race if they come up behind you and they're trying to get past you, actually move over in a gentleman fashion or uh, stay in front? Well, at this stage, uh, we're a race within a race, I suppose. But ultimately, of course, we are in the same series. I mean, I got outright championship points at Knock Hill. That was good, and that's the second time I've done that this year. Um, I suppose that hurts a little bit with some of the factory teams. But, you know, we're here, and we're, I'm, I've, I've been there, and I'm running as hard as I can. But I have to drive with my head more than my heart. We can't really afford to crash the car. Um, purely because of financial reasons. There's no doubt that experience counts for an awful lot in uh, touring cars and particularly trying to develop the car and find the right direction uh, because you baseline everything with your previous experience and you always try and make the, the new car you're with, the, the team with you with, and obviously I'm with Ford and very happy being with Ford, but we're obviously trying to push that car, that the Mondeo, into uh, a championship winning car and uh, that's part of the challenge and that's what I actually enjoy really. I mean, technically trying to get the car uh, quick enough and contributing to the overall design package um, and the evolution of the car for next year. I thought the Fiestas were pretty quick, but those beasts! Now, it's an appalling fact that every year seemingly spontaneous fires start in ordinary cars like yours and mine while we're just driving along. Take a look at this and take heed. If fire breaks out in a car accident, someone trapped has little chance of getting out alive. Vehicle fires can start with leaking fuel or electrical short circuits caused by collision damage. That happened on the M6 near Broughton in Lancashire in 1985. Twelve people died. But fires can start for no obvious reason, and deaths from car fires have doubled in the last ten years. I was driving along the M56 going to see my mother, um, and um, it was a really hot, sunny July afternoon, and um, driving along, and I thought my feet were getting really hot, but I just put it down to the tarmac getting really warm because it was a really hot day. And I could smell this kind of rubbery smell, and I just thought, well, that's the tyres as well. And um, the next thing, I just glanced down at my feet, and I just saw flames coming out through the pedals, up my legs, and I just, just couldn't believe it. And I just, it was just like fear, instant fear. I just thought, any minute now, this whole car is just going to blow up with me in it. Linda never found out the cause, though faulty electrics were considered most likely. Ben, this is obviously an older car, but I think for the purposes of illustration, it shows us quite clearly a couple of obvious problems, starting with the engine. Yes, this is typical of older, badly maintained vehicles, uh, covered in oil and, and rubbish, and is the call, common cause of fires in, in such vehicles. There's a large hole in behind the air filter there, uh, which, whilst it doesn't exist on the newer vehicles, is, is typical of the areas which allow fire to penetrate from, one, uh, from the engine compartment into the cabin area. However much crash protection a car has, broken fuel pipes present a hazard that worries firemen. But fire can spread in an undamaged car. Car owner's nightmare. Absolutely dreadful. Please keep a careful check under the bonnet of your car and get the engine cleaned up. 
Well, that's it for part one. In part two, we'll join the two Johnnies, John Stanley in a BMW Z1 and John Wright in, yes, you've guessed it, in his garage. See you then. Hi, welcome back. Some years ago, BMW stopped producing a relatively rare vehicle. Only 8,000 of these automobiles were made, and they were lucky to get that far because the Z1 started out life as a concept car. John Stanley has been finding out more. Style is very much an illusion. We all see catalogues and brochures and cars and clothes and think they suit us because, in a sense, the illusion in the advert or the brochure suits our impressions of ourselves. The BMW lifestyle brochure is full of ladies who clearly don't intend anything but careers and men trying desperately hard to look like the male models they are. It doesn't have a lot to do with the huge number of BMW drivers you see in the traffic jams at the end of every working day, but they like the illusion. In the 80s, BMW's Series 3 car was definitely the fashionable item. It was there for the shoulder pads and the mobile phones just as much as the enthusiast. But in truth, it was not a particularly safe car. In fact, in Sweden, they banned the big six-cylinder versions because they were considered unsafe. The trouble was primarily that they were not terribly good at the back end, that they were very light and they were very inclined to break away. And this made for an awful lot of accidents and an awful lot of second-hand 3 Series that you want to stay away from. It was a matter of making profits from the uppies and naturally it was good business, but it didn't do anything for their reputations as handling cars. So in just three years they produced a concept car based on the 325i, which was actually to test a new Z axle and rear suspension. It was to have a steel monocoque construction with plastic as a moulded body and indeed plastic floor as well. Just to make it very 80s, it was all recyclable and therefore very green. Part of the concept was actually to have a very smooth undertray. Even the exhaust system was rounded off. And they claimed, probably with some degree of success, that it was the first production car to actually have race car ground effects as a form of, of road holding. The low centre of gravity with this Z rear axle and all the other bits combined to make it a really much improved car. So when it was shown, there was a huge demand for it. It was really only a concept car, but as a result of demand, two years later they began making just 10 cars a week in a factory in Munich. There were 8,000 made in all and officially they were sold at £37,000, but needless to say in the late 80s there were a lot of silly premiums paid. This is that car, it's called the Z1, the Z2 didn't exist, the Z3 we all know and celebrate. The engine was the 2.5 litre that was traditionally in the 325i, it developed a 170 brake horse, the trick was that they placed the whole unit behind the front axle in order to try and improve the suspension and the handling characteristics of the car. This was of course a show car and therefore it was full of gimmicks and full of little things to draw attention. The seats for instance are a perfect 80s example. They are silk screened onto leather and when it comes to doors nothing gets more complicated if you're a late 80s lady in their evening kit than getting over and down into this machine. The door may have been considered something of a gimmick at the shows, but according to BMW, this is not an affectation. That was interesting. In the late 80s I spent a lot of time driving a 318i, which although I didn't own it, I seemed to feel very uncomfortable with. The problem was the back end always was on the move, it was very light and it was very unstable. 
This, on the other hand, is quite the reverse. These high sills give enormous center, sense of rigidity. There is no feeling of vulnerability. There's nothing like the Alpha Spider currently has, where you can feel the rattle and the scuttle shake. This feels very, very rigid, despite actually being made of plastic. A number of things about this are endearing. The gearbox is, as any BMW driver will tell you, a delight to use. The steering is very neutral. The balance of the weight is 49 to 51%. So again, it gave all the right ingredients to those who were criticizing. It proved that BMW could create a really stable platform. The rear end, the Z axle, was actually something that they proclaimed at the time was a centrally guided special double wishbone which in real terms was really a sort of self-adjustment of the toe-in, toe-out stresses on the rear wheels. And in fact, it does help. It's nothing spectacular, but it's part of that cocktail that BMW make with what they call the driving machine. The only real criticism was power. This particular car would rev to about 5,800 revs, and it would give you 0 to 60 in about 7.9, which was really respectable but the people were always after more. And the new 5 Series engine gave that opportunity. There was a 192 brake horse on stem there if they could put the engine in. But the BMW people wouldn't let that happen. They felt that they had made their point with this. They had created the stability and indeed, upon public demand, had made 8,000 as a token. That, they felt, was enough. What they had learned was going to be placed in the next generation of the three series saloons, which we all celebrate as being good cars. And then they just left the legacy of the Z name, which now is carried very proudly by the Z3. Despite what's been said recently, at least that BMW can't be called common. Thanks to the classic yearbook author, John Stanley. Anyway, it's time once again to wing our way over to join our mustachioed master mechanic, John Wright, for another edition of Inside Motors. I've got with me Brian Walker from St Christopher Motors. Now, his main trade is to deal in between main dealers with cars that they don't want. But as part of that, he does a good job of valeting. In fact, he's known as Huddersfield's best valeter. Behind us, we've got a seven-year-old tired Fiesta. Mechanically perfect, well-serviced, brilliant. But the bodywork is dull, lifeless, and horrible. And Brian promises me that in two hours it'll shine like a new car. Now Brian, would you like to take us round the car and show some of the features that really make this look dull and horrible? Okay, this car's been used to go up and down the motorway at speed. We've got all the dead flies on the front, we need to get rid of those. We've got the bird line that's already started to eat into the paintwork here. That should have been got off straight away. These surface scratches that you can see, they'll all come out once we start cleaning the car. And as you walk around this side, you can see we've got some wheel trims missing off the, the front wheel there. Again, surface scratches all in here, all around the handles. One or two stone chips that really, they should have been touched up as soon as they started at the end of last winter. They've left all last winter's dirt and grit and salt down in the crevices here. Ne never been taken away with some more bird lime on the back here, um, which quite a big blob there, that might leave a nasty mark. And again, we've got some scratching around here. And really the car is generally tired and just wants a little bit of love and care and attention. And that's what we're going to do. Give me two hours. You promised us, you've got to come good on your promises. Okay. We'll see you again in two hours.
Just a quick question. How long have we been using one of those? Oh, I guess 20 years now. Right. For those of you at home, you can do a hell of a lot of damage with one of those. In trained hands, they're a magic tool. But for the untrained, two, 300 quid's worth of paint and work damage in an instant. Just be careful with one of them. Let you get down. A lot of damage to yourself as well. <laughs> That looked a bit of a lethal weapon, that, Brian. Uh, I wasn't going to speak to you when you got that in your hand. <laughs> that gets rid of most of the dirt, though, from all under the wheel arches and all under the bonnet. Uh, we're now ready to start and make the thing shine. You get it shining. I'll just stand and watch you Again. do work. Hi, <laughs> oh, Brian. I see you've shifted the car, and you've given me this stuff. Uh, what's yeah. going on here? Well, this is the easy part now. We've done the hard work. We've got rid of all yesterday's grime. Let's see if we can make it shine now. We've brought it into a dry part so that we can paint the tyres without getting them wet again, that's all. Right. What do I do with this stuff? Rub some on. Just as simple as that? Carefully. Yeah, plenty on. The work's been done. This is to put the protection on. Right, do you want me to start on the bonnet then? That'll do. Right, I finished with this stuff. Right, what on earth is that gunk you've got in your hand? I'm blown Wheels away. and tyres. Come on. <laughs> Two hours ago, Brian, if I didn't know you better, I thought, I thought you'd be telling us lies, but true to your word, I mean, two hours ago, I wouldn't have gone tuppence for a second glance for this car. Now I might actually pay good money for it. That'll do. Thanks, John, and we'll be joining Inside Motors again next week. Also in next week's show, we'll be travelling across the English Channel with our half-microphone wheel travel motorsport reporter, Richard Warren. He'll be taking a look at the Ford Car Rally Car. And the glamorous Yasmin Mills will be investigating a southern offering with... Two wheels? We'll see you then.